This episode is sponsored by Simple Practice. Running a private practice is rewarding, but it can also be demanding. Simple Practice changes that. This practice management solution helps you focus on what's most important, your clients, by simplifying the business side of private practice like billing, scheduling, and even marketing. Stick around for a special offer at the end of this episode. This episode is also sponsored by Green Oak Accounting. At Green Oak Accounting, they believe that every private practice should be profitable. They've worked with hundreds of practice owners across the country to help them gain financial peace of mind and assist them with making smart financial decisions. If you're interested in speaking with a member of their team, visit their website at greenoakaccounting.com today. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is the podcast where we talk about all things therapists, the things that we do, the things that go on in our personal lives. And we are once again today joined by one of our Therapy Reimagined 2021 speakers, Rashawn Miller and Sometimes we we know some of the people who are applying to speak for us. Sometimes we get really amazing people coming from everywhere who somehow oh find out about us. And when, when I saw Sean's application, we were like, oh, we've, we've got to have this guy. Because <laughs> he's amazing. And so really loving getting a chance to know some of our, our faculty that's coming to our conference and, and can be presenting to us. So thank you very much for joining us here today. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. We are so excited to have you. And the first question that we ask all of our guests, who are you and what are you putting out into the world? I'm Rashawn Miller, a therapist based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I also founded Eustress Inc., which is my nonprofit to raise mental health awareness in black and brown communities. That's one of the major things that I'm putting out into the world, trying to be who I needed when I was younger and being able to address those issues, especially within my community. Part of what you're talking about at our conference here is a little bit of this both sides of the couch aspect of both the perspectives that we learn as clients and maybe some of the stuff that doesn't line up with what we're taught as therapists and helping to bridge those two differences. So one of the learning questions that we ask, so a lot of people don't have to make the same mistakes that we have is what do, what do we see in therapists do wrong when it comes to understanding the client's perspective? Ooh, uh, that's that's a loaded question, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> I would say one of the first things is treating a client like a client and not a person mm-hmm. and, and not being able to understand, you know, that there are different layers to just the things that we see presented from an aspect of how we diagnose someone and how we treat them as far as what type of treatments are, are uh, adequate for whatever symptoms they're presenting. So I think that's the, probably the number one case uh, because a lot of times we, we, we base a lot of things just off of the DSM or things that we learned in the, your diagnosing class and you know assessment class and all of that. And we try to put everybody in one particular box, but those things are not necessarily true, especially when you're dealing with different types of populations and from different cultures and just different backgrounds. What do you think is the biggest problem with treating someone like a diagnosis? Oh man, you you miss signs and you miss things that can be actually effective for that particular client. And it may, you know, keep them into that particular box. You're not able to allow them to grow. Uh, but then also the client will get stuck into that box too, because I've seen people when they receive a certain diagnosis, they will act up to the diagnosis instead of yep. trying to <laughs> be better. When you start to treat people just based off of their diagnosis, you will miss a lot of stuff. One of the things that you're doing with Eustress and a lot of your work is working within black and brown communities. And some of the stuff that I've seen on your social media, I heard some of your talks that are available on YouTube is about some of the ways that even some of these diagnostics appear differently across different cultures. Katie and I are pretty white. Uh, I, think, I think we're really white. I think we're, 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 really? Really, we're really white. We, we know that... <laughs> We, we know that there's a lot of inherent white bias, even in, in stuff like diagnostics. How are we seeing stuff, even like trauma and some of these diagnostics coming across in different cultures? 
Oh, ah, man, another loaded question, Kurt. <laughs> 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 I would say a lot of times, like even we miss certain things um, as far as. So I, I always give this example of, you know, ODD as far as oppositional defiant disorder. And you you base something off of a kid that's, you know, in school and you just get the the criteria based off of, you know, what the teacher says. Oh, the kid doesn't want to listen in school or they're they're talking junk or they're talking back or, you know, they're hitting on other people or they, they're defiant to the different rules. For me, I first of all look at, you know, well, what's the home structure like? Maybe he's living in a single parent house and mom works two or three jobs just to make ends meet. And so when he gets out of school, even though he may be 10 years old, he's like, yo, I'm the man of the house and I get to do whatever I want when I want to do it. So if I'm governing myself from three o'clock to midnight when my mom gets off of work, why wouldn't I do the same thing when I go to school? You know, so you're taking in those cultural factors that may play a role in them. And you know, I mean, yeah, there may be some, you know, defiance there, but then there are other things that play into it. It's not just that he wants to be that way, but that's how he lives his life. That's how he's he living in survival mode. And, you know, certain things he understands, this is how I need to act. And if I don't step up for myself and, you know, rebuke certain things, it could lead to something damaging for me outside of the school setting. So it's kind of hard for some people to separate those things. So being able, when you're, when you're not paying attention to, you know, the, the different cultural backgrounds or the, the settings that they're dealing with, even some of my kids that I work with, when they're coming into school, they may not have had any food. You think about when you don't eat, if you haven't eaten in, in 12 hours, think about how angry and you, know, you don't feel like dealing with people. So imagine someone that, only food that they get is when they come to school or if school is, and now saying that we're in a pandemic, school has been out for a year and a half. So what are these kids doing now? So you think about all of those, just those different factors. And then also what things do you deal with? What do the kids deal with outside of that hour of therapy that they're with you? Katie and I have both worked in various aspects in South LA, which is a predominantly black community within Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. I worked in some of the schools there for a better part of a year. And one of the things that I even noticed was just even the way that some of the systems interact with young black men. I live in the suburbs of LA. It's not the same kinds of interactions with law enforcement where even just kind of the survival mechanisms of, you know, Hey, you're bugging me again. I'm tired of this. That can be really seen in kind of this oppositional way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, systems definitely play a, a large role. And one of the things that we we uh, don't always acknowledge is these systems were set up for, you know, white individuals, It's particularly white male individuals to thrive in these particular arenas. And so if you don't disrupt those systems, I mean, the people that are oppressed will remain oppressed. And we we are always I speak from my, my vantage point as a, as a black male uh, that grew up in the South <laughs> and 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 rural south at that <laughs> i see it all the time when i was even when i was raised my, my mom and dad and my, my family members would tell me certain things that you cannot do as a black male you have to always be on guard no matter what their main concern is i want you to come home don't worry about you know if you go to jail or anything i can we can always bail you out but don't re, uh, you know don't get into an argument with a police officer or any of those particular things because i don't want you to lose your life over something that's trivial and you know you just be, show respect always keep your hands on the wheel make sure you know if they ask to search your car yeah you have rights but at that particular moment you don't just I, I just want you to make out of that alive. But then also not even just with police officers, uh, to be honest with you all, man, I, I in rural South, I, I've seen KKK rallies and mm -hmm. I've you know witnessed these things. Uh, I had a individual that I, that I went to high school with. He was hung in his backyard, uh, you know, wow. like so like these are. This this is my reality. This this living in this in this world. But then also as you you go through, you see just so many people that look like me that are constantly still taken out by the police officers. And you now you you're thinking like, yo, when is my turn? Or my son, my son is two years old. And I'm I'm scared for him, and he's only two. We carry along a lot of these different pressures and stuff as we go through society that. I say this in the sense of it's no fault to all white people because some you just some people you just live in your bubble 
And, and if you don't, if you don't know, you don't know. But you know, I, and I had these conversations even with some of my colleagues and some of my friends. But sometimes it's now it's time for us to push the envelope a little bit further and challenge these systems that hold a lot of other people back. Well, and I'm just even reflecting on the the comment around people living up to a diagnosis, and I, I think about the oppositional diagnosis mm-hmm. and how many. And I worked in a probation. Teen, teen boys on probation was kind of how I framed it in my mind. And there were a lot of oppositional and conduct and ADHD and all of that stuff. And I think even as you're talking, and I think I kind of knew it then, this was quite a while ago, but I, I feel like it's so strong now is that there's all of the cultural elements of at play, as well as the interaction with the system. But there's also so much trauma and necessary hypervigilance. And so to be labeled as oppositional because you're in fight or flight, all the time, like just it feels like it would really impact someone's self perspective. It seems like it would affect how they interact. It's, it, it affects how people view them. And I know you've very publicly talked about your own diagnosis of bipolar. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, what is your relationship with that for yourself? How is it for you being someone on both sides of the couch, given that there's sometimes utility in diagnosis, sometimes not. And there's just, I, I don't know, I'm kind of going all over the place. So I'm just going to let you, I'm throwing it back to you. But but I, I just think it's a really interesting thing to kind of grapple with because there are sometimes a need for diagnosis, sometimes a utility for it. And sometimes it's just wrong. <laughs> it's just plain it wrong and harmful. So. Uh, and so even, even with that, man, I think it, it comes down to the aspect. So when I received my diagnosis, I, I, re, I rebuted it. I, I did not want to agree that I had bipolar disorder. For one, it's not something that I was taught growing up. But then also, to be completely honest with you all, it, who I received the diagnosis from. It was a white psychologist in, in a psychiatric hospital. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know, you don't know nothing about me. <laughs> so yeah. like, I just want to, I'm going to just roll with it so I can get out of here. But then also as I got older and then, you know, just like I experienced just battles with, with uh, my manic phases versus my depression phases and the suicide attempts, I really understood that this was a framework for me to understand how to learn myself, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't have to only live as somebody that that has bipolar disorder. But then that's, you know, but that comes to terms with understanding what it means. I mean, what it looks like for your particular life. And so, and then being open and honest with yourself and understanding that you can, you can thrive beyond this. Because also I would say when I received the diagnosis, my doctor didn't necessarily explain it too well to me. And so I was like, what are you talking about? And, you know, they, they throw all of this jargon out here and I, I was like, yo, this is, this stuff is going over my head. I don't know what yeah. this actually means. And so I had to do, do my own research and understand what it meant for myself and, and started to do re- research on myself. And that's with my own journaling and understanding what does a manic phase look like for Rashawn Miller? What does a depression phase look like for Rashawn Miller? And being able to, how, what things do I need to implement or intervene within, in addition to whether it's medication or whether it's, you know, exercise, diet, all of these particular things. So that's what having a diagnosis made me sit down and be like, okay, look, now it's time for you to research yourself. And, and but, okay, I, I, they give you this framework of what it looks like, but how can you step outside of this particular box and still be able to be who you are as a person? How have you been taking your experiences on that side of the couch and uh, using that to inform your work with your clients and also sharing this with other therapists about what it's what it's like in that human relation aspect of being able to connect here? The human relation part goes a long way, especially with working with a client, because I, I know I, I take from being on that side of the couch. I know what I hate it. I hate it sitting on the couch. I hate it somewhat. Well, tell me about your day. I ain't got nothing for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I'm going to sit here and shrug my shoulders. I, I don't know. Also realized that as I started to learn more about when I went into my, when I started to uh, my, my educational practices and techniques and stuff and these modalities and all of that stuff that was, that was taught to me, I was like, yo, 
this ain't gonna work with the population that I'm working with. This ain't gonna work in the hood. This ain't gonna work if I'm doing in home in home therapy and I got I'm trying to work with a client and he got three or four brothers and sisters running around and doing all of this other stuff. This is not going to work. And so just being able to understand people as people and connecting with them, but then also taking my own experience. Like I, like I said, I hate it sitting on the couch. So even when working with my clients, you know, especially if I'm working with, with young boys. All right. You know, what are you really into? I, I'm not going to talk about your symptoms at first. I want to know what things do you like? Are you like to play video games? All right. A part of my own personal training, and I know this is not official training, is me learning how to play video games, me playing Fortnite, <laughs> me playing Call of Duty, all of these particular things, because those are the ways that you're going to be able to relate to this person that where they can break down their walls. So I'm playing. I have a PlayStation in my office right now. And like when my clients come in, no, oh, what video game you like to play? All right, let's hop on the sticks. And we playing video games. And while we're hopping on the sticks, I was like, oh, so what's been going on with your day? You know, what do you like about this particular video game? Why you? Why did you pick that gun? Or why did you like, so different things, then you will start to learn more about the person instead of that typical therapy dialogue that you see on TV, right? And so yeah. you got to be creative with that particular thing. Or I'm taking, I, I work out with some of my clients or we're going to the park, we're shooting basketball, we're throwing the football. Shoot, I, a couple of my clients I skate with. So, you know, nice. stepping outside of that box to make them feel comfortable and meeting them where they are is very important. I have so many questions because I love all of that creative ways that you meet with somebody in person and, and really connect with them in a human way. So anyway, I, I just, cause I I'm, I'm starting to do a little bit of like going outdoors and stuff like that. And of course, when I was working with teens, I did it all the time. And so I was like, okay, I know kind of what I'm doing, but I feel like it's, it's such a different experience having an experience with somebody versus whether it's the computer or in your office, just sitting and staring at each other and trying to have a meaningful conversation for some, that is exactly what they want. But so many people, I feel, feel like it becomes so overwhelming mm -hmm. to try to do mm -hmm. that. And so I love all this creative stuff. How do you it's make intimidating. sure that you it's intimidating for people too? Yeah, exactly. And so how do you make sure when you're connecting with these clients that you've set the stage for this therapy in a way that feels comfortable for the therapist and comfortable for the human? I would say for one of the things is making sure that I'm comfortable and I'm, I'm comfortable with not even just a point of knowing, knowing my skill set and knowing how to intervene in certain ways and, and throw certain jargon out there and how to pull questions out. But then also I'm comfortable if I'm playing a video game that I don't know about, I'm comfortable with asking my client, oh, teach me how to play this. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that creates that that opportunity for them. It creates that opportunity for them to realize that, OK, I don't know everything. I'm an expert in certain things, but I'm going to relate to you on for you to be an expert in your own life and then me to help guide you through those particular things. So that's that's when you really set that tone and they'll be like, all right, this person is going to walk with me instead of drag me, pull me or push me. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's a complete difference when, you know, when that, that type of therapeutic relationship. Yeah. There's no blank slate when someone's teaching you how to play a video game that you're bad at. <laughs> I, I am the bad at because I'm not good. I'm not good. But yeah. A couple of the things that you're talking about here, you mentioning even from your own story about diagnosis from, you know, white psychologists. I'm imagining that a big part of this plays within the way that stigma comes across, especially in a much different communities. How have you seen this in your life going from clients to therapists? Have you seen any of this change at all as far as where we're seeing stigma? Because I know even a lot of your work promoting mental health, in especially in black and brown communities, you're doing the work. So what have you seen change, if anything? I've seen a lot of change. So, so I've been working in the mental health field since 2007. So I'm 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 a I'm a seasoned vet with this. Uh, so you know, seeing even more celebrities and stuff talk about mental health, uh, you start to you know hear people talk about you know depression, anxiety, uh, just those different things. Uh, you start to see people a little bit more open about certain things. But then also, there's still you know a lot of times, especially with men, we, we when they're talking about it, they're talking about it with a whisper, and they're only talking about it with certain people. So you know, but again. Now, at least they're starting to talk about it. But then also you have people that are still, they still are 
reluctant to certain types of treatments, whether that be medication, because that you know people don't trust medication all the time. I'm not a pill pusher, but I also don't negate it because I had to take meds myself, and I understand uh, what it does for me. But then just understanding that you know this it's not for everybody. Uh, but then also I think that comes back down to treating people as human and understanding what works for them. So I know a lot of people that I work with. Self help is a lot is a huge thing now as well. So you know understanding people's chakras. So I had to learn about chakras. I, I learned about Reiki. I became trained in Reiki. Uh, oh, wow. You know, all of these particular things and, you know, and, and incorporating some of the Eastern practices in addition with some of the traditional African practices, in addition to combining some of the Western practices and, you know, being able to bring all of that stuff together. And I don't shut down anybody when it comes, whether that be their religion, their spirituality, all of these, all of these things play a huge role into who this person is. And so you have to still meet them where they are. And so, but as I see this particular change, I started to see more churches talking about mental health. I started to, you know, you started to see more campaigns on social media about certain things. Or you started to see people's uh, understanding the effects of bullying and all of this stuff, how it plays into, you know, one's mental health. And I mean, again, our language about certain stuff has changed. Like, I hate when people say the word crazy. And so I challenge people, yo, find another word because you you don't have a definition for that word. So, and and find another word for it. That's to, Watch how we talking to people, watching how we criticizing people, understanding that we're not giving people grace to be able to learn or we, you know, we live in a cancel culture now. How are people supposed to grow if you can't sit there and hold a conversation? You just completely exile this person. That's the same thing we were doing with psychiatric patients 50, 60 years ago. Yeah. So mm -hmm. at, at what point does do we change? So I started, you know, we're starting to see a little bit more progress there. But then also, again, going back to the systems conversation. And we need to see more funds going to these certain things. We need to see, you know, certain ways that insurance companies are reciprocating uh, therapists for providing quality care. Because some people are not, I know some some therapists don't want to see Medicaid clients because for one is all the red, I hate that paperwork when it comes out of Medicaid. It, yeah. it is a <laughs> head. No hey. fun. Uh, <laughs> but then also reimbursement rates and, you know, all of those particular things. Like I know some some insurance companies pay different for virtual therapy than they do in-person therapy. I'm like, bro, it's the same therapy. So like, I mean, so it's, it's you know, just those systematic things also need to, you know, change. And that, that plays a huge role into the stigma as well, because, you know, certain insurance companies, they make you diagnose somebody. And that leads to other issues and stuff, but you can't build unless you have a diagnosis. And you're like, okay, well, what is this person is just dealing with stuff? And I don't particularly have a diagnosis for them. You mean to tell me I won't get paid for it? So, I mean, it's, it's so many layers to it, Kurt, but I think it's definitely been some forward trajectory as far as addressing stigma and being, but we still have a long way to go. I agree. I think there's so much that has been done, but that also needs to be done. And and Kurt and I are actually doing a series around fixing the mental health care system in America. And and that's what we keep coming up against is that there's there are funding issues and there's bureaucracy issues. And and I think for me when I'm listening to you, I I just had this picture of easy accessibility to mental health care or mental wellness or or kind of wherever people fall on the spectrum of of what they need without worrying about diagnosis, without worrying about some particular frame, without worrying about some particular checkbox or some particular paperwork, but people could just come and get support and truly have it flow in and out of those things. And to me, I don't know much about the your stress corporation here, your nonprofit, but I'd love to hear more about it because it feels like there's, there's an element of that because you stress is like, well, stress isn't bad. It's just how you take it in. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that idea. But to me, it's like, if it's just kind of integrated into daily life and therapists don't make themselves inaccessible or overly formalized and, and, and treating people like diagnosis, I guess, very long way around to the question, which is like, what is an ideal that you see as far as how therapists or the system could provide for the mental health needs of society? Whew. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say one of the things is, for one, we don't have enough therapists, period. 
So us being able to get individuals that are interested in uh, becoming therapists, helping them with school stuff and, you know, funding there and then, you know, helping them connect with seasoned therapists and some of these restrictions that come come along with, you know, who, who what you can provide over state lines and the state licensure. I feel like all of that stuff is is I feel like it should be a universal licensure yeah, for, yeah. for the United States. I don't understand why there is, because if I am in North Carolina and y'all know a black male that may need my services in California, you should be able to refer to, as long as I have the capacity to be able to work with him, I should be able to work with him. So those are certain things that I feel like needs to, needs to happen. But then also when you have such small, I think a lot of times people don't understand we as therapists, when we're working with clients, how much we take on from them client from them clients. And so people look at, oh, well, why do you charge $200 an hour? Why do you, I was like, yo, cause I do a whole lot of work. <laughs> and, but then uh, the insurance companies, if they don't, you know, if they don't meet those same type of uh, requirements with, as far as reimbursement rates, that's when you have the therapists that are like, Either you have someone that takes the insurance and they're taking 50 to 60 clients a week and they're burnt out. So that quality of care reduces or you have someone that doesn't take them at all. So you have, you know, both sides of the of the fence there where you're trying to straddle it to figure out where is that particular balance. And then under, some people can take on 20 and don't feel overloaded. Some people can only take on five. But then also you still have to live life outside of that. So how are you you know, funding your life outside of that? Yeah. And then also, you know, certain types of therapy I, I do. So I do a men's yoga class. Of course, insurance won't pay for that because they, they, yeah. they don't consider yeah. it, you know, <laughs> or, or certain insurance won't pay for Reiki when I do Reiki with someone. So, you know, us opening up the gates when it comes down to different types of therapeutic interventions that could be utilized on people, uh, whether it's a drum circle or like, again, so we know that I can't say I play video games with uh, my clients to as a therapy <laughs> session because then the insurance company will look at me like, no, that's not billable. How you go tell? I can tell you what I got out of him in that session, but I can't yeah. tell you that I play yeah. video games because so just it's so many layers to it. But my approach, even with Eustress, one of the, the initial goals was to be able to raise awareness. And I realized that Talking about mental health is a difficult conversation, especially in my community. So I make it fun. So I do the, the mental health awareness walks. I just held my sixth annual one here in Charlotte. And nice. I do a, a mental health awareness gala as well, giving people a reason to dress up and we can come together and have fun. I gave away six scholarships to black males that are pursuing their degree in a mental health field from a higher level, higher ed level gave that away. But then also we do the adult coloring nights. So just had one of those last night. Oh, um, yes. Uh, introducing coloring as, and then like, so also understanding that we can teach people, give people these different tools that they can implement into their daily lifestyles that can help them throughout, you know, their day, whatever they're dealing with on a daily basis and understanding this can be a supplement to therapy. Because I also, I always tell my clients that, you know, they're, I'm not here to fix you. And you're not going to get all of the answers in this hour long session. So you need to actually do the work outside of therapy. And that's something that I realized that I had to do. So, uh, you know, doing those particular things. Yeah. And then also one of the major things I, I realized, too, is when I'm working with, especially when I'm working with, with my youth, I have to work with the youth and I need to work with their direct care supports. Because, like I said, that hour with me goes out the window two days later. I need yep. to get the parents on board. I need to get the, their siblings on board. I need to get their teachers on board. All of those. That's why I started the Young Black Male Eustress Initiative. So I, I had seven uh, young seventh graders. I was working with them. I worked with their teachers and I worked with everybody in their household. I did it all for free. But when I worked wow. with the teachers and when I worked with the with the with uh, everybody else that was in their household, it wasn't about how to serve the actual student. It was about what issues are you dealing with? And what supports do you need? Because once you change their support, you change the child support system and how they feel about themselves, they're going to pour that good into the child. So you got to change the ecosystem about mental health around that particular uh, individual. And then being able to, that's how you really affect change. I'm hearing a lot of similarities of what you're doing along with uh, one of our previous interviews with Harry Aponte about really looking at this beyond the scope of just an individual problem and really, especially in underserved communities of normalizing that if we just 
make a lot of things better. People tend to do better. <laughs> that, <laughs> but you know, as you know, Katie's last question and hearing you talk about stuff, I'm today years old when I'm realizing that out of a lot of the health services, you know, medicine, dentistry, you know, eyeglass, all of those have regular checkups that are covered by insurance. And mental health, you inherently have to have something wrong with you in order to come into the system, which I, I think creates some of this barrier and the stigma that, you know, we're, you know, being taught in our grad programs, you know, come up with a diagnosis in 45 minutes. So we're, you know, grasping at straws a lot of times to find justifications to make people's systems better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and a lot of times when we're getting people, we're getting them at their worst moments. Yes. Well, and, you know, how many times have we been sitting in sessions where it's like, you know, if you just come in like five weeks ago, like we could have prevented a lot of this. Like the, it has to, <laughs> it has to get to this point where, all right, get to your worst moment, then come into us. But, you know, if there is something for us to do with, you know, all of our advocacy work here, it's potentially challenging for uh, some of these insurance companies to invest more in preventative care. So that way we're not so overwhelmed by people just being in their worst moments. Agreed. I completely agree. And that will reduce the, the ED visits, that will, that will reduce the crisis calls, that will start to reduce some of the suicide rates, some of the substance abuse issues, all of these particular things. And, and But then also you're, in, you're increasing the education of the individuals you know, in, in the community and then developing these peers that can start to intervene a little bit sooner. I'm just I'm just struck by this model of shifting the system and really because I, I worked in a wraparound program, which has a similar flair to mm -hmm. it. But of course, the system has to be in gigantic crisis. You know, child protective services have been called or the kids getting ready to be on probation or there's been a serious mental health concern requiring hospitalization. And then you know, everybody comes in and they include everyone that the person's ever met, it feels like sometimes to try to, to p build the system. But all of it still has that bureaucracy of I'm going to talk to the parent or the caregiver or the coach or the pastor or whatever. I'm going to talk to that person. But all of it has to be around talking about the kiddo that we're trying to help versus really trying to understand this person. And of course we always, you know, it's, it's like playing video games. You, you do what you need to do and then you document appropriately for mm -hmm, billing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's such a freeing idea to think about if we could actually do these mental health checkups, have systemic intervention. So people are learning these coping strategies that they're learning how to communicate to each other, learning how to identify what's going on. And therapists could be in both stages, right? Therapists can be in the preventative care. They can be in these kind of creative spaces and they can be in the crisis care. It feels like a doable job too. I'm just thinking for either from the therapist point of view, like how cool would that be? So you've really created like a pretty awesome job for yourself. Like that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It does. And then, then, and then let's say if you're only serving up to five families, mm -hmm. you know, where you're not too burnt out and it cuts down on all of these particular things. And let's say you're, you're dealing with close knit families. I mean, that thing could, it could easily change the trajectory of generations if you're able yeah. to do things that particular way. Yeah. That's so powerful. We're having you at Therapy Reimagined for those who are interested in following you, seeing all the stuff that you're doing. Where can people find you before Therapy Reimagined? <laughs> I tell everybody, if you can spell my name, you can find me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll spell it so out in our show notes for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you can spell R-W-E-N-S-H-A-U-N, you can find me. I'm on uh, Twitter. I'm on uh, Instagram. Facebook, 
Uh, then also my website, uh, keep up just the, the different events that I have going on. But then also check out eustressinc.org. That's where I do a lot of the stuff when it comes down to uh, just some of my events, like the coloring nights, uh, the the walks and the gala. Then also, you know, just whatever else that we have going on. I also have a book that I that I uh, wrote a few years ago, and I have a journal, a guided journal uh, called Why You Stress, the Why You Stressing Journal as well. So people can check that out. And it's it's really based off of my own personal journal that I used to use to do research on myself. And that's, you know, really tracking, you know, what foods did you eat? How much water did you drink? Did you take your meds today? Who did you talk to? But not only who did you talk to, how did you feel before you talked to them? How did you feel after you talked to them? If you're talking to this person too many times out of the week and they make you feel like crap after the fact, you may need to reduce the amount of times you're talking to this particular person because that's a risk factor for you, not a protective factor. So, you know, being able to teach people those particular things and I feel like those things go a long way. I think I need that journal. I'm just going to go get it right now. <laughs> and I'm just being reminded to drink my water here. So. <laughs> And we all need help at some particular point, right? Yes, yes, we're all human. Mm -hmm. So we will include links to a lot of Rashawn's stuff on our show notes. You can find those over at mtsgpodcast.com and check out the Therapy Reimagined Conference with all of our most recent updates. You can find that at therapyreimaginedconference.com. And until next time, I'm Kurt Winhelm with Katie Renoy and Rashawn Miller. This episode is also sponsored by Green Oak Accounting. Green Oak Accounting specializes in working with therapists in private practice, and they have helped hundreds of therapists across the country reach their financial goals. They offer a number of monthly service options that can be catered to a practice's needs, from basic bookkeeping to premium CFO services. Other specialized services include profit-first support, compensation planning, and customized KPI dashboards. They help therapists achieve their clinical goals by making sure they have a profitable practice and offer unsurpassed support along the way. If you're interested in scheduling a complimentary consultation, please visit their website at greenoakaccounting.com forward slash consultation to learn more. Thanks again to our sponsor, Simple Practice. Simple Practice is the leading private practice management platform for private practitioners everywhere. More than 100,000 professionals use Simple Practice to power telehealth sessions, schedule appointments, file insurance claims, market their practice, and so much more, all on one HIPAA-compliant platform. Get your first two months of Simple Practice for the price of one when you sign up for an account today. This exclusive offer is valid for new customers only. Please note that we are a paid affiliate for Simple Practice, so we'll get a little bit of money in our pocket if you sign up at this link, simplepractice.com forward slash therapy reimagined, and that's where you can learn more. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 